Okay. Uh, this is lecture 19, and it's as uh, TC just said, the grand journey uh, through the uh, list of groups that live in crystals. But we're going to mention uh, some that don't. This is the, our favorite for the Mr. Fuller molecule. But I want to uh, spend my time on the octahedral group, which uh, happens to have the same, um, uh, as far as mathematically uh, structure goes, as, uh, as the tetrahedral diagonal group. We'll show maps uh, between all of these things as we go through this uh, today. Um, and I will mention the, the spin a half uh, symmetries. Uh, but uh, they won't be discussed in any detail beyond uh, just mentioning them. We'll take the T group, the tetrahedral group, and do its minimal equations, in class algebra basically, its minimal equations, its class projectors, and, and uh, from that come the character tables, the uh, irreducible characters. And uh, the octahedral will get the same treatment, minimal equations, projectors, characters. And then we will uh, talk a little bit about the group that's twice as big as O, which is called O, o horizontal, OH. And it's a direct product of that with the parity group. So this will be a chance to see uh, standard notation for parity in most of atomic and molecular uh, physics uh, and, and uh, get a feeling for how to do it. Then we're going to go through some correlations. We're going to work the correlations of some, of some uh, particularly important, physically important uh, subgroup chains. And uh, finally, at the very end, in just, just a couple of uh, pages, uh, we'll preview the applications of this to high resolution uh, laser spectroscopy. So let's uh, go ahead here and get started. And the first order of business is uh, the octahedral group. Here's a map of the groups that we uh, find in crystals, the 32 crystal point groups, as we've shown several times here. Right now, we're putting big circles and pictures around the ones that are non-abelian. And there are 16 of those. And then the other 16 are abelian groups, which are just uh, isomorphic to outer products of cyclic groups. So they're extremely simple compared to these other fellows. And this is the uh, I would say uh, the king of them all, and uh, really OH is the king, but this is the one that does all the work. And uh, uh, the other one that's of particular importance is the tetrahedral diagonal uh, group, but all of the basic cubic uh, octahedral, tetrahedral symmetries are used a lot in uh, physics of uh, both molecules and solids. We're sitting over a laboratory that's very worried about the changes of symmetry from octahedral uh, to something else. And uh, the results of that are uh, some very interesting devices uh, and uh, new effects. So this is uh, a field that's coming alive again, uh, the, the symmetry analysis of octahedral-like uh, objects. Now, <clears throat> before I do that, I might point out uh, something that's on uh, the slide that's over here. Just to give you a little bit of encouragement to go through this uh, rather daunting roadmap of uh, symmetries, uh, let me point out, and I'll mention this actually uh, a number of uh, times uh, as we go along, but really only three groups uh, in this whole pile of 32 uh, is uh, um, necessary to get down and uh, do the dirty details in, in working out their, their uh, characters and irreducible representations. Once you've done those three, and that's the one we're going to do today, it's the monster of them, uh, we've already done uh, D3. Uh, the homework assignment uh, uh, was uh, D4. Okay. Once you've uh, mastered them, you've done all the others too, because they're either outer products with simple groups, or they're subgroups, subgroups of this one. So uh, that's why I want to encourage you uh, to, um, you know, uh, go at this uh, with uh, that in mind. And so, beginning here with uh, 
O, which stands for octahedral cubic. An octahedron fits inside a cube, and a cube fits inside an octahedron in very symmetric ways. They're called conjugate regular polytopes uh, when they do that. Um, the octahedron can be numbered one through four and therefore is isomorphic, uh, this octahedral group, uh, to the tetrahedral TD group, uh, which is in turn isomorphic to the permutation group of four things. One, two, three, four. And that is a really uh, an important doorway to uh, a family of groups called the substitution groups, SN. And uh, we'll try to get uh, some of the wonderful mathematics of that going later on. In the meantime, we'll pretend we don't know this. And the thing that I want to show here is that the order of these groups, octahedral, TD, um, uh, and uh, the permutation group is uh, 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 either six uh, hexahedron, that's cube squares, uh, times four corners, that's 24. I'm just uh, imagining all the different positions that I could put this in. I can face me, make a, a, a six different faces come toward me, and each one of those can have four different positions. So th this is a sort of a clumsy way to figure the order of the group, but it's a useful one and easy to do. Uh, or I can have an octahedron with uh, eight uh, triangles, equilateral triangles, and have three points. Eight times three is also 24. Or I can just look at the lines that make up either the octahedron or the cube, you see, and uh, th those can be in two positions. And there are 12 of those, and that all the product is also 24. So uh, whenever you have a, a system that's uh, geometrical like this, this is an easy way to figure out what the order of that group is, the, the number of elements. That's the first number uh, that we need to know when we do a symmetry group uh, that's finite. Okay? What and if was, it's not what finite. What was the order of D3? D3. Uh, consisted of a triangle which had three things, but each of the uh, points could be put two ways. So three times two was six. six. And we had six elements, which consisted of the unit operator, the two 120 degree rotations, R first power and R squared, which we're going to be dealing with again because we're going to do subgroups again. And then finally I1, I2, and I3. Remember those? Yeah. Or row one, row six. two, and row three. This so one has 24 elements. 24. Wow. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, that's a wow. Right. It's big. And okay. Yeah. So we're 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 going to tackle a big group. This is this is not trivial. The other groups are fairly trivial. Is it possible for us to understand? understand what these operators are doing exactly like D3? Yes, we must do that first. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we need to understand, we need to do everything we've done with D3. We need to uh, uh, classify it according to positions it can be in. That's sort of what I'm counting here, right? But we also need to uh, classify it according to the operations that make those positions. Okay? Yes. So we're going to play the same game. Uh, same game, it's just it's going to give me 24 of these things instead of, uh, of uh, uh, one quarter of that. So uh, let's go through the operators. Well, as I said, one is the, the loneliest number, right? Unit operator, okay? There's, that's a class of one, okay? Every group's going to have that uh, so-called trivial subgroup, trivial uh, element, but <laughs> pretty important because that's the one we're going to spectrally decompose, right? So there's your first class, okay? Now I'm going to give you a really big class. This is a class of eight, okay? Every one of the eight faces of an octahedron has a trigonal rotation, which we, we've been using lowercase r yeah. uh, to designate that. Well, now you've got eight of those. But actually, the way we're going to number it is we're going to number R1, 
and R2 and R3 is down there uh, on the other side, okay, of R3 squared, okay. But there, uh, what I've done is I put two and three here, and one and four there, and that makes a tetrahedron uh, in, in position space uh, in this space, okay. And then the inverses of those are labeled on the other side. There's an R1 squared that's hiding. But the other ones are shown, R2 and R2 squared, R3 and R3 squared. And remember, R3 squared is R3 inverse. R4 squared is R4 inverse. So each of these is a rotation uh, using your right hand. And that, and that means that uh, I put my hand this way. Uh, and do a right hand rotation with my thumb out on the axis. That's what uh, is going to be 120 degree rotation. Okay. And then if I do that twice or inversely, this is also a right hand rotation by 120 degrees. So all of these axes are a 120 degrees, not minus 120, but 120. And they're all on plus or minus one, one, one axes. That's the crystal notation if a coordinate system was lined up with the corners of the octahedron or the faces of the cube. Okay? So we've got nine elements now. We've still got a ways to go. Okay? We've got eight plus one. All right? You see, this is really quick, but this is the way you get the details. Okay? By classes. Okay? Here's a class of three. 180 degree rotations. Now I don't bother uh, to have an inverse of this one, the inverse of 180 degrees for a classical, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, boson-like uh, system. I don't have to worry about that thing of 180 not, uh, or 100, 360 not being the in, uh, inverse of itself. This is classical group here that we're talking about. So. Um, uh, I am doing here 180 degrees rotation with either hand, okay, on the x-axis. Number one, uh, x. Number two, y. And number three, z. Now you may be a little disappointed that the z-axis is laying down, but think for a moment of all the physics in the world and how many times does the actual accelerator axis point up. All of our lasers downstairs are on tables this way. <laughs> Right? So I'm going to put this thing in honor of the experimentalists. Okay? We'll let the Y be up in the air. Okay? So there's three more uh, elements uh, around the 100 axis. That's crystal notation. Okay? And we're going to use uh, either R squared, like it's written here, or I'm just going to put a row X, row Y, row Z, and we color it green, as you'll see when we actually make a, a slide rule for this group. Okay? So we st we're using little r and little rho, uh, kind of the way we did for D3. Then we switched to i uh, for D4, and I'll show you why we did that, because that's another class that's coming up here. Okay, so far so good. This is half of the group right here. This is a subgroup. This subgroup is called T for tetrahedral. Don't ask me if you could... Uh, why that is. That, that's a little bit of a mystery, but uh, the, the, we've got half of the group now. And, and it's a big group by itself. We're going to tackle that one uh, separately. Okay? And then go ahead and do octahedral. Alright, here's a class of six 90 degree rotations. Okay? Plus and minus 90 if you were just looking at the x-axis. But again, uh, R means a right hand 90 degrees rotation. R cubed means a right hand rotation around this axis, which is a left hand uh, rotation uh, around this axis. It would be going that way. Okay? That's the x axis, that's the y axis, that's the z axis. One, two, three. And we will use a symbol R tilde for the inverse so that I can write this in small spaces. X, Y, and Z. Okay, so that, that, and it'll also have a green coloring to it on the slide rule. Okay, so there's the uh, rotations that correspond to positive 
uh, Cartesian axes, and there the rotations that are the negative. Again, a tilde is put there uh, for an inverse, just like it was uh, over here. Okay, makes it so it's one symbol. I don't want to have these exponents, uh, sh you know, showing. Subscripts are okay, but I want to get rid of the exponents, and I can do that with this group. Okay, we're almost done. We have six more. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you have class of six ninety degree rotation? Doesn't seem. Doesn't the other one, the eighty one eighty degree rotation, unnecessary? It is twice. I mean, when we. It's two of these, and that makes it a different class. You see, there would be. In order to be in a class, oh, that is, the relationship that you have with the other members of your class is that the various elements of this group can transform you into your, somebody else in your class. There is not going to be any operation here that's going to transform this, and by transform I mean T, T inverse. When we rotate two times R1, we will have R12. Well, two times yeah. R1 squared degree. would be that guy. Yeah, but right? the other. The but this degree. one, you take two times this thing, that mm -hmm. puts it in another class. Mm -hmm. You see, that's something we didn't have with the D3 group. R1 and R1 squared were the same because they one was right and the other was upside down right. That means left. Right? They were inverses of each other. And so, uh, all I had to do was apply a transformation with an I operator and turn one into the other. So they, that was proof right there that they belong to the same class. Okay? R1 does not belong in the same class as R squared. Have we got a, have we got an O table? Multiplication table? Here? We're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. It, it'll be more apparent there, I think. Yeah. But um, the uh, thing that you can see right now is that uh, the operator, if you were to draw little pictures of operators with 90 degree sectors attached to them, right, they'd all have a 90 degree sector attached to them, right? Whereas this thing would have a, a pi attached mm -hmm. to it, and a pi and a pi. Very different. I got you. Now in D3, uh, it would be a 120 degree thing attached to them, right? But 120 the other way looks the same if you turn your head the right way. So they belong to the same class, but this one does not belong to the class of that one. No Good negative question. axis I mean, for one, right? Pardon? There's, there's no corresponding negative axis on the other side. They're identical. That, that's right. So that's one difference, right? Yeah, that's a major difference right there. Yeah. So their algebraic properties, they're like black and white. <laughs> yeah, really different, um, what, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're using the word class, but gender, blah, 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 and so forth. You can make all kinds of anthropomorphic uh, crazinesses that go with this thing. We have enough trouble already <laughs> <laughs> with this without doing that. All right, we got six more. And they also are 180 degree rotations like this. Can you spot them? There they are. On every line, there is perpendicular to it a 180 degree rotation axis. And here they are numbered. One, two, there's kind of in a plane together. Five and six are in those planes. Three and four, there, it's a little harder to see, but you can you see that they're, they're, uh, they have their plane as well. And there's no way that an element in this group, this is the whole group now, there's no way in this group to transform I1 into one of these. This, they're both 180 degrees, but the ones that are around 110, all you can do is permit these numbers and change their sign. That's all you're allowed to do. So this is different from that one for that reason. Now this one you see, uh, 100, zero, zero, uh, they uh, share axes, that's for sure, but they don't share the 90 degree or 180 uh, turn. 
the the other 180 degree rotations. Um, These guys. Right. Those do not have a C4 supergroup. It sounds elliptical, but these over here, these other 180, are yep. like a subgroup of a C4 group. Local. That's right. That's right. So that's another way of distinguishing. And and these three together make a subgroup called D2 that we've al already looked at, right? Yeah. That was a four group, very famous group. Very good. Group. The easy to spot. Okay. Too. Yeah. So there's a subgroup right there. Then there's another subgroup just associated with. Uh, these guys, and then there's a subgroup associated with a couple of these and that. We'll, we'll get into all of that. This thing is lousy with subgroups, as you can see by the map. Okay? So, uh, this, is, this is what you really need to uh, make a space in your head for. Uh, these I operators, uh, we'll use that notation uh, as well on the uh, description of the thing. Now, let's, uh, we'll keep this picture up here. Here's the picture of the slide roll, okay? And just to give you a feeling for it, I'll bring it up in front here. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a medium-sized version of this. This is an <laughs> auditorium uh, version of this slide roll. And, uh, the other version that I have that you can uh, take, and we can make more of these, this is more something for your hand, but it, the idea is uh, that, um, and you can see this picture, I've shown the back sides, you see, and the bottom, and then here's the top and the uh, plus sides of the, uh, in this case I've got the thing uh, oriented here. This is the x-axis right here, this is the y-axis right here, and there's the z-axis right there. Okay, so it's a, uh, a, actually that's the positive x-axis right there, uh, and then there's the z-axis. So this thing is a little bit turned compared to this one, but the same thing, the y is definitely up here. Okay, so if I were going to do that, and I've got this thing marked, there's the minus y-axis right there. There's the plus y-axis. All of the things that actually do operations are shown in little white figures uh, that um, indicate uh, their power, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, let's forget the reflections for a while. This is the OH uh, in here as well. But there's the I uh, number two uh, right there, you see. and. Uh, Let's uh, go ahead and find the unit uh, of this thing. You sometimes you have to turn it around a little bit. But there's, there's the uh, location now, the position of a wave function, if you will, uh, that's called number one. All right? And uh, here is a rotation R1 uh, sitting on this corner right here. That means an axis comes out of this little triangle. Uh, and I'll turn the thing so you can see that, uh, all three sides of that little pyramid there. But that's the R1 axis, and it's a 120 degree uh, rotation, you see, uh, uh, around. So it's going to take us, uh, take this edge right here, you see, and move it over to this edge, and it's going to move, um, let's see if I can get the, uh, that uh, show. Yeah, it's going to move. Uh, this one over to this position. So there's the R, little R1, lowercase r1 position, 120 degree uh, rotation position, you see. And its inverse uh, is uh, over here. So, so when you hold this thing up, uh, so you're looking down the R1 axis, that's our the first class, uh, an element of our first class. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna rotate through the diameter of the cube. Yes, yes. Yeah, R1. Uh, this diameter. Mm -hmm. Through the yeah. center. Yeah. And when we rotate it, we will have the same as we had. All these three R. Well, these three what you do triangle. is, yeah, you do not move the operators. The operators Here. are fixed. But I would move the wave function that's marked oh. by one over Here. To, the, to the R1, R1 position. position. And yeah. then I would uh, do the one, if I went the other way, Right, that's going you, clockwise. Yes. I'd end up there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
Now later we'll see the reflections. They're, they're a little bit easier. There's a plane going through here called the Sigma 4 plane. Right there, right? Mm -hmm. That's a mirror plane sticking out like this. And there's one Sigma 4, right? That's what we had to, when we do C3V, remember? Instead of D3. So they're all here too. Uh, we're going to start off just talking about the uh, operations uh, that uh, belong to O and not OH. This has 48 elements on it. That's OH group. Mm. Okay? Oh, including that sigma? Those yes. sigma? Yes. 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 All of those, uh, all of those extra elements. Let's just go ahead here. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, here's the uh, octahedral symmetry right here. Here's its subgroup, T, that consists of the little R1s and their squares, and the D2. Okay? So there is an O symmetry. And then if I drop down here and do an uh, inversion times all of these elements right here, I get the rest of what's called TD symmetry. But if I put inversions on each one of these things, and there's the inversion by itself that went on the unit, okay? Then I uh, make a subgroup that's called TH. So this is a, a, a pretty neat road map that shows uh, what all of the four uh, octahedral, tetrahedral groups and subgroups uh, uh, look like uh, for this amazing symmetry OH. But right now, we're just talking about this one right here, which is O symmetry. <coughs> and uh, here are the four uh, right here. Um, <clears throat> that we're diagramming, not counting uh, D2 or D4 or any of the others. D2 is this little guy right here. That's the only one of the abelians that's uh, indicated on this diagram. You can uh, look at them later on. But um, uh, we're going to focus on this guy, but it has the same multiplication table as far as a mathematician would be concerned with this one. And that's the subgroup that, that's indicated by this set right here. This is the boundary that contains those uh, 12 elements there. And then th this is the subgroup right here called T that consists of these 12 elements here, 8 plus 4 in the 4 group. It's quite a pile of operations. It's quite a structure. and. Uh, the world is made out of things that use this structure. That's uh, uh, what's important. Your blood cells have a fourfold symmetry, uh, D4 like, actually, C4V uh, symmetry, uh, which is that one right there. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and your D, well, let's not get into uh, all of the applications of this thing. But in any case, um, <clears throat> there is the picture with all of them going at once. So there's the picture of this device here with a plus Z axis and the yellow doesn't show up very well on the slide there but uh, there's the uh, there are all of the operations uh, on here <clears throat> and uh, as I said it's a lot easier to do things with this because you can turn it around and see easily where everything is whereas a diagram like that you have to think about on the back side now, right? So it's not quite as convenient. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is a real pain because you got to walk around it. <laughs> we have web-based versions of this now. Pardon? We have web-based yeah, versions? Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. Uh, we have these things on, they're, they're called the, the, the codex. Uh, yeah, you can rotate it around. Yeah, you, you soon can, to be stereo pair. Yeah. We have a casahedra group. <laughs> the biggest this. one of all. And let me go back to that one real quick. <clears> TH <throat> symmetry. This is a strange bird, uh, say the least. Um, I, I'm going to advance this uh, uh, one over here um, if I can, if, I, if it'll work for me. Let's see if I can. I think I've got a did uh, bus there. Um, I'm going to have to do it on this one. Command L, and then advance uh, that one ahead so that I have the picture that shows 
uh, all of the operators uh, fairly clearly. But uh, the part that I'm interested in right now is that one. Okay, so we'll leave that up uh, for most of the uh, rest of the talk. Um, where we have the road map, and then this is a complement to that. Um, but um, what I wanted you to see was, and let me point to this one uh, right here, TH. This is the symmetry you get if you just take uh, two rectangles of arbitrary aspect ratio and, uh, and, and make cut holes so that they can uh, penetrate each other uh, symmetrically. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful symmetry. And then if you just twist them, sort of uh, make it sure the twists are always the same, you get uh, something that looks like T. It's sort of a, a propeller uh, that has a, a propeller axis that's the same in all of the different 111 plus or minus directions. It is, it, this and this are really quite bizarre. They're, they're hard to visualize. But I would say that O, O symmetry, the one that doesn't have uh, the O H symmetry that these things do, is also bizarre. And I've lost my O model, so I, you, you, we're going to have to make uh, you. You can um, try to make one. But the same thing is going to happen. It's going to destroy the reflection symmetries of the planes. Uh, only rotation symmetries left in O. They're all rotations. Uh, these. All 24 of these are rotations. Okay, well this set of cards, this, these triplet, if the rectangle is a golden rectangle, that means it's, it's got a, a ratio of 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. Now how can that be this, uh, this the one ratio? Well, one ratio, or the inverse of it, uh, is 1.618 is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2 is minus 0.618. So both of them are point, one is a 1.618 dot 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 dot, and the other one is 0.618 dot 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 dot. Same aspect ratio. This is the 1.618, and that's the 0.618 right there on the end. Anyway, if you then connect those 12 points, it's three rectangles with each of four points each, connect those 12 points, you get the highest possible symmetry in three dimensions, the icosahedron, 20 sides of equilateral triangles. And it's conjugate, just like the octahedron fits in the cube, the dodecahedron fits inside this thing with point a center points of each of those triangles having lines between them. So there's the king of all for the uh, Cartesian three dimensions. Uh, and of course, these were known by the Greeks. Sorry. It's amazing I, symmetry. I have a question. I don't, I don't get the idea of symmetry in, this, in these three pictures, in these three images. Okay. When, when, when we have rotational symmetry, it means that when we rotate, everything is the same. That's right. When we have reflection symmetry, when we reflect everything through the reflection that, is the same. The, the symmetry, as you say, uh, could best be described as something I can do to an object. Um, if um, I look at the object and I turn my back and you do something to that object, and mm -hmm. then I come back and Seems I remembered what it looked like, it's still there. It hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. So that that's absolutely true. Is um, what are these exactly? I can I cannot, I cannot. I mean, see any relation between that and these. This one. This one and the other one, the complicated one. Mm. Uh, At first, this one is you, that the reflection symmetry? Is mean that well, if you reflect, I don't see any changes oh. through that. You bet. You bet. Let's move over okay. to this picture here. Okay. Let's Rotation. move over uh, for that. 90 degrees. Since you picked on TH, let's uh, look at this picture here. Okay? Mm -hmm. These are reflections. The, the, uh, they're, they're funny kinds of reflections. And uh, the, the, these, uh, actually, it, it, when I get done putting an I on the 180s, I have the X, Y, and Z plane reflections here, too. 
Okay? Oh, I misspoke. So that together makes uh, what we call TH symmetry. When I Here's the boundary of TH uh, symmetry uh, right there, containing T, of course. All of these groups here contain T. T is common to all three of these. All four, if you count the one that's the biggest of all and closes them all, the octahedral symmetry, OH. But in any case, uh, mirror plane reflection is easy to see, but the hardest operation to visualize is I times 120 degrees. So I do 120 degrees, and then I invert it. That means I take every point on one side of the origin and put it in an uh, opposite point. So these are very hard operations. They're called rotation uh, reflections, or rotation <laughs> inversions. That's exactly the way they're written here, but they are also rotation reflections. So that is a uh, un improper operation. All the operations down here in the lower plane are operations that uh, for a classical object, we cannot do without destroying. All of these operations up here are just rotations, which do not destroy a rigid body. So everything down here uh, is improper operation. Has a determinant minus one. Turns things that are right-handed into left-handed. Which you can't, I can't turn my right hand into my left hand without destroying okay so um, don't feel bad if you can't visualize most of the operations down here but the mirror plane reflections such as this one and I noticed that uh, somehow I'm missing uh, I times those four things that would have to be there I got the I but I don't have mm -hmm. the, the ones that uh, go with but all of those are mirror plane reflections some of them are diagonal uh, plane reflections there over here, these things, I times little i. So that that's a, um, you know, the, you, you see um, pretty much all the structure that the crystal point groups have, it's all here. Now this is weird. Because if I take those dotted lines out from out, you know, just erase them, I have a symmetry that does not live in a crystal. It's got a five-fold rotation. In fact, it has 12 of them. It has 12 different 72-degree rotations. And then it has 12 more 144-degree rotations. So it is bizarre. It is completely bizarre. Nevertheless, when the buckyballs, which have this amazing symmetry, this thing right here has five-fold as well as three-fold. Now, it looks like a hexagon, but it isn't because one of these things is attached to another hexagon. Uh, the neighbors are attached to a pentagon. So it has five-fold axis here, three-fold uh, rotation, 120 degree rotation axis through there. But this would just be a sawed off version of an icosahedron. If I sanded off the corners of this thing, I'd make a pentagon at every one of these corners and I'd have this object. This is carbon 60. Carbon 60 makes a crystal, but it's face centered cubic. And it tries to get this symmetry. But as soon as it finds it, there's another one that way it could have done it right next to it. So this thing at, at room temperature and, and very and to very cold temperatures is uh, in its crystal rotating completely freely with all of its partners and the neighbors. So it's a, it's 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 a, a solid. You'd think that if you put it down on a table, it'd roll. There's all ball bearings in there rotating. So. This is a very bizarre story that has not finished yet. And this is the highest symmetry of R3 space. Okay. It is a truly a monster for, uh, in, in terms of the way we've seen this so far. Okay. We will talk about bigger groups, but um, it, it's the 
biggest one that we really saw uh, in a physical way. Okay, now the octahedral groups that are all here, OH, which I've just I've gone through, and they're all listed out here. This is that slide that I'm leaving up there. This is the slide rule, so to speak, uh, for uh, multiplying them. But you need more than that. And by the way, here's all the notations uh, put in the places they belong that are on the slide rule, you see. So uh, we do have to uh, make sure that that's not confusing. You see, and to make the slide rule small, I had to keep each of these elements to be a single symbol and a subscript with possibly the inverse symbol on top of it if it had an inverse that was different from itself. This is a different story entirely. This is a group table that you get by using the slide roll. So that's, you know, a pretty formidable uh, collection of products there. But they have minus signs where they belong. Because here I'm using the Hamilton turns that we talked about for uh, doing multiplications of things that have spin a half in an octahedral framework now. So here are all the 1, 1, 1 uh, rotations and um, the uh, actual names for them are in the unit column, R1, R, little r1, little r2, 3, 4, and then little r1 squared or r, r1 tilde. Okay, those inverses of these, right? And then here we start the four group, finish the four group, rather. We are heavy unit, and then there are these three x, y, and z, 180 degree rotations, plus or minus 120, plus 90 degree rotations are r, x, r, y, r, z, one, two, and three is what it's written here, okay? And then there are inverses, which is minus 90 degrees, that's all one class for this group, okay? And then there are the 180s around the edges of the uh, either the octahedron or the cube, I1 through 6, okay? And they go on 1, 0, 1 axes, various permutations of 1, 0, and 1. These are various permutations of 1, 0, 0, and there's that many of them. And then finally there's permutations here of 1, 1, 1, and then the possibility of putting a minus on uh, some of those. That's what the bar means. So this is a, a pretty formidable thing that's done with this slide rule. This is a Hamilton turn vector addition uh, thing. And this is a three-dimensional picture if you uh, look at it wall-eyed. Left eye looks at that, right eye looks at that. You can see uh, uh, this structure in, in 3D. It's just a reproductive of all three of these superimposed. Those are the Hamilton turn arcs, the great circles of these rotations. Now we won't be using this, so I'm just going to point out it exists. We'll come back to it later. Let's begin the class algebra. And I'm talking about just this much of that huge table that I was showing you there. The one that consists now of uh, plus 120 degree and minus 120 degree. And here we're kind of stuck because before I made a class of eight out of this, I can't do it anymore. I don't have any rotations in here that can turn plus 120 into minus 120. So uh, these are separate classes. And we have four classes just in the first part of the group. The octahedral group has only three classes showing in the first part of it, and then uh, two more making five classes altogether. This one has four classes altogether. The unit, the right-handed 120s, the left-handed 120s, and 180s around it. What was the reason we divide these two? Because there's no transformation in this group that can turn uh, R1 into R1 squared, or R1 tilde. And by turning, I mean I have to do that transformation for together. F. I have to take an element. Together, no, R1, R1 will give us R1, 2. If I were to do an R2, uh, say, on this thing right here, and then R2 inverse right away, I've got to do both of them. That's what I mean by transformation, class transformation, right? Mm -hmm. 
If I were to do that, I'd end up something like that. I would not get anything in here. There is no element in this group that can do that. Turn one of these into one of these. Oh. Beside, the, beside themselves. Well, I mean, if I if I if I take some elements from O, they will turn these into these. Yeah. But they're out there. We can't use them. We're not allowed to use them. Uh, see, class is a relative thing. What with each other, I mean, R1 and R1 will, will give us R12. Can you see? Yeah, if you, if you were to do a product uh, of, you know, one of these, each other, one of these, and then you got to do the inverse, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that kills you. you you'll, you'll, wind up, you'll wind up either with back in here or maybe over here, but you won't get over here. You can't turn the right into left-handed. Just with what's in here. But you can do it pretty easily with the stuff over here. That's <laughs> a little bit surprising. And most people don't know much about this group. This, as I say, it looks weird when you draw a picture of its things. But uh, you can see it's got four classes, not three. So it's very, it's very, it's, it's sort of analogous to D3, but in D3, R1 and R1 squared were in the same class. Here they're not. I'll tell you another group that you know very well where they're not in the same class. C3. C3 consists of one R1 squared, and I'm sorry, R1 and R1 squared, right? Yes. There's no element in that group that will turn R1 into R1 squared. Because it's abelian. Right? So when you do the TT inverse, the TT inverse come right through and kill each other. We're thinking about This is something, one of the things to, you know, think about uh, later on. Um, and that means we're going to get complex representations of this thing. The reduced representations are not real for this, as we'll see. The characters are not real, not all real, okay? Okay, now we need the class products. When you got the table, there's no problem. I just look in there, for example, what's the product of the class of CR with this class of 180, the class of row, okay? I look in there and I see, oh my gosh, all I see is little r's, but how many? I see one r1 here, one r1 there, and another one right there. Three. I know right away I'm going to see four, uh, three of the r4s as well. There, there, and there. And three of the r2s. There's a little r2 there, a little r2 there, another one there. Now, you're, you're not accounting for the minus sign now. Yeah, ignore the minus signs. That's the double yeah. group. That's for the spin a half t. Oh. That's the group that is a, it's it, it's actually called a double group, but it, it, it's what we call a half group because <laughs> yeah. we do the algebra rather than making a big group out of, out of that. Okay, so uh, that's what you do. Like for, for this one right here, where I do r with R dagger, okay? Well, now I'm getting four R1s. One, two, three, and four. Forget the minus sign, okay? So I get four CRs. Um, this one up here, or this one down there, okay? I see four ones, so that class appears four times. And then the row class appears also four times, like R1 squared. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, and there's one there. And then you can see the two and the two, and the two and the two, and then the three and the three, and the three and the three. So that, that's our uh, product. Now, I didn't put anything down here because this is equal to that, right? This is equal to that. 
and this is equal to that, just to remind you uh, of that fact. Okay? Class sums of uh, it's commutative. Obvious. It's commutative. This is not, but, but this is. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what we need, minimal equations for enough elements to get the characters and the projectors. Okay? Well, here's a minimal equation for the, this guy. That's what we uh, worked off of for C3V. Trouble is, um, it, it can help you, but it isn't uh, the uh, uh, complete answer. First of all, C rho squared, okay, that's uh, three ones plus two uh, rows, okay. Well, that's a minimal equation right there, and it's only order two. I, I need something of order four if I'm going to do this whole thing. I have just found a minimal equation for a subgroup. The subgroup of this thing is the four group. This guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. One and C rho. So uh, that's, that's helpful. I, th I could use that to finish the job, but I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to go and look. I'm going to, the eigenvalues I can check later on. I'm going to go for the minimal equation of this guy. Okay, so CR squared is four times CR tilde. Okay, that's CR dagger here. Same thing, it's a unitary operator. Okay, inverse. Okay, then CR cubed, I put in there CR on that thing. Okay, well, a CR uh, with CR tilde. Okay, this guy uh, with this guy. Okay. Wait a minute, what am I doing? There I am. I get 4CR, okay? Four, I'm sorry, 4 times 1 plus 4CR. I get this thing right here. Okay, this times that. Or that times this would be the same. Okay? And I put those together. All right, that's a, a th third order equation that involves something besides CR. I've got a C rho. So I do it again. I put CR fourth power, okay? It means I've got to go through and multiply every one of these things by a CR. Well, C rho, CR, that's no problem. C rho or CR, C rho, three CR, okay? So I pick that out right there, okay? And that gives me CR fourth minus 64 CR, which I can factor uh, like that and then completely factor it like that. So now we can make our, proje our projectors. That's the minimal equation uh, for that element. You need uh, all of the dimensions that are available to us to make that, and that means it'll give us a complete set of projectors. As I say, this isn't mandatory to do it, but if you can do it, you definitely want to try this out. So here are our, uh, our e to the 2 pi i over 3 and e to the minus 2 pi i over 3. And we're going to be new, doing arithmetic with those. So this was the diagram we uh, made up before when we were doing arithmetic with uh, something that's uh, a trigonal uh, representation. So here is the minimal equation written out. We have a 4 epsilon, a minus 4 epsilon star. These are conjugate roots. You have to have that. That's theorem of algebra. And there's another uh, root here, a 4, and then a 0. Okay? Each of those is going to give us an irreducible representation projector. And I'll call this one the P4 epsilon. 4 epsilon means I've left out the root 4 epsilon. I've just cross that out, and now I've got a product of the remaining 3. Divided by, and this is our, uh, our item formula, the 4 epsilon minus each of the respective eigenvalues. So this should be a normalized projector. Okay? Well, we've got to do the algebra. That's the hard part of this. Okay? We have to do complex algebra, too. <clears throat> okay? So, and this is the same one. This one down here, a 4 epsilon star, I leave this out, I get this, then I get this, then I get this, and then I put the roots in uh, the same way, okay? And finally, I leave this guy out uh, right there, okay? Then I've got this guy, and this guy, and this guy, okay? 
And you can see there are going to be a lot of cases here where the factors are the same and you just have one extra factor. And finally, the one that goes with a zero root is this guy. Okay? So I just put down these three things. And then subtract from zero the eigenvalue of uh, those uh, numbers there. Okay? So yeah, this is a real non-trivial development of algebra here, using complex algebra uh, to help us. Okay? So let's go back and put these things together. Okay? I'm going to have a CR squared, and then I'm going to have a little middle term here, and then I'm going to have uh, 4 times 4 epsilon star. <clears throat> with a plus sign here actually, but this is minus times the whole quantity. I see that as a uh, little bit of a, um, uh, a typo error there, I think. But anyway, when it comes out, we're actually going to be multiplying these things and then using the table to straighten that out, we'll get a thing that looks like that. And this one comes out to be this. This will just be the complex conjugate of this, so I'm going to write that down right underneath that one. There is a uh, projection operator. Okay? So this thing is a linear combination of classes, and now I can read off these numbers. Now the catch is I've got to read off L mu and O of G, but then I realize that for the first one, this is also L mu, so L mu squared over order of the group. The order of the group is 12, okay? Uh, and uh, I've got a 12 here, so I'm, I'm seeing right away that I've got a 1 up as a coefficient here. That means these are single dimension uh, representations. This is going to be a 1 by 1 matrix, like our A1 and A2 for uh, D3, okay? So that's taking care of, of half of these uh, uh, things. We've still got uh, a little bit more to go here. So there's a character table that we've gotten so far, and I just uh, putting it in standard notation. A chi actually epsilon and epsilon star. But very often they use the letter E here. Should this is different from the E's that we're going to be talking about later. Okay, we go on. P4. What is it having uh, to give us? Okay, so I put it together the polynomial together, read off the uh, results uh, from the uh, table up what there. We, what, can you, can you, sorry, can you please come back? I'll, I'll pop yes. back here. Yeah. Why did, no, why, why do we have their dot for the kappa? Oh, that's what we're going to find next. Oh, they are one. <laughs> are they one? We've yes. got... We, we've got four item potents we've got to get. We've got four classes, so we've got to get four item potents. Oh. Right? And four characters, uh, four different complete uh, so row sorry. of characters. Does that make sense? Because, you see, this is sum over classes. Oh, oh, we have to write instead of G for each one of them, yes. one R, e Each R. one of these four guys here have got a place on this table. Yeah. And I'm just putting them in the order that you will find this table if you look it up in a book. Sorry, sorry. Uh, obviously, you, you would just put it right there, and then you have two more blanks. I'm putting the blanks where they show up in the, in the regular table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So. See there, you're right. Yes, here. Correct. Well, we've seen this one. <laughs> you always color this one red. It's a scalar. It's all ones. <laughs> we could have we could have written that one down first, yeah. right? And then we could use that to get the orthogonal complement of the next one. But I'm going to go ahead and finish it this way. Okay. So I write this one out. I've got a little of algebra to do here. But fortunately, the denominator is really easy. Okay. So I end up with a thing like this. I still have to do the products of this and this. So I have to do a full cubic product here. Okay. Collect the terms, okay? And when I do that, I get a rather simple answer. Everything cancels except the row and the one. And I got a three quarters and a minus one quarter. This is a three dimensional representation. You can see that right away because the coefficient of three right here 
then multiply it by another 3 because you would have an O of G of 12 here and cancel it, right? That would be 12, but then the, the two threes would cancel. So this is working. There's the uh, answer. We've got a triplet in this symmetry. This is a weird symmetry, really weird. Okay, now let's do the class algebra for the big guy. Now, at first you would say, I don't want to do that whole group table. And if you, you said that, you could get away with it. It's unnecessary to do 24 squared, 576 products, since each row or column of a class has the same class proportion. For example, C rho CI in the, this character table would be giving us the C rho, which is R1, R2, big R, 1, 2, and 3, multiplied by, say, the class uh, of CI. So I have I1, I1, and I1. And then I go and I go, uh, well, what's next, you see? Um, if I uh, did this, um, let's see, I don't know why I exactly wrote that, but uh, the idea is that when you uh, expand this thing out, as soon as I see the result of this R1 squared and I1, that's why I wrote it, it's just to work out the product, I would see here that I have got two of the elements of the uh, 90 degree class and one of that 180 diagonal uh, uh, class. So I've got twice as many of those 90 degree rotations as I've got 180. But I'm not done yet because this thing consists of six terms, you see. So I have to do a proportion, okay? It'll maybe twice this, okay? Four, etc. you see, always two to one. So when I, uh, when, once I know this, I can go ahead and say, oh, well, my order of my row class times my order of the I class, that's three times six is 18 terms. Yeah, I've got six this way and I've got three that way, so that's what we, what we have to take. So th this would let you, uh, this, now this is just a proof that the class proportion cannot vary. In any case, the, following this sort of uh, argument, and uh, it probably wouldn't hurt uh, just to uh, go ahead and on this uh, slide over here, put the entire group table uh, up there. Uh, I'll do that now. That uh, came, as, as we uh, said, uh, before, let's let it wake up here. It's an old machine. Whoops, I went too far. There we go. Okay, so you can go through there and check, for example, uh, that I've got eight ones. There's four plus four. Then I've got four of the class of R. Now the class of R now consists of R and R squared because I can transform. Uh, those things. You can obviously see that from this diagram here, uh, or this slide rule. Uh, so I'm going to have four of those, and then uh, up here I've got how many of those 180 degree around X, Y, and Z do I have, you see, uh, the row class. There are eight of those in there, okay, in that uh, uh, collection right here. So, once you have the group table, you can write this down very quickly, but I want you to be aware, if you're writing a computer program to do this sort of things on a, on a uh, group, that you can shorten it uh, by using that uh, result. And, and when you're talking about huge groups, uh, that can be a savings. So here's the thing we need to solve. We need a minimal equation, and I'm going to pick the last one for reasons that you'll see, it can make for me a equation of order 5. Here's C2 uh, squared, okay? A CI squared is just that right there, so I write that down. Then I put another CI on it, another one of these onto that, so I get a CI and then a CI times R and a CI times rho. Well, CI times an R is this thing. And CI times rho is this thing. So I've got a situation that looks like this. Uh, that's as far as I can go. CI cubed is equal to, but that's not an equation just for CI. I need to keep going until I got an equation that's all powers of CI. That would be a minimal equation. 
you see. So I multiply another ci onto this thing. Okay. Now I've got to go and look at i times r. That would be right here. Okay. There it is. And I also have to look at a ci times itself. So there's the, that uh, right there. Okay. Collect the terms. And I've got something that looks like that. Okay. Now, it looks like it's kind of a, a mess here. You see, I go and put another CI on that thing. Get this, this, and this from the table there. Okay? And end up with 640 CR, 656 CI. Okay? Now, putting another CI is not going to help me. Instead, a well, sum linear combination to this has to add up to zero because there's only five dimensions in this algebra. The, the three, the three and five. This is the fifth power. This is the fourth power. Third power. Uh, you want to add all of them? Yeah. Well, you, uh, most. You've got to you've got to play it a little smooth. See, because there's ci to the first, right? Mm -hmm. Now we could do uh, ci. Uh, in other words, what I, what I notice right away is that I can make a linear combination that cuts this way down. I can make a CI cubed equal to CR and CI. And this is where it gets a little tricky. There should be easier ways to do this. But I finally end up here with something that involves all CIs. And that's what the, the, the thing is. So I'm, I'm seeing here a fully factored five-dimensional five, five uh, rank uh, algebra, minimal equation for CI. From this, we're going to get the character table. But you can see it, uh, the, the, the problem is finding a linear combination of your powers that adds up to zero or multiplies up to zero. So let's take that, which is right here, and build projectors. The first one that I build is this root two. Okay, so I can scratch that out and put down. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I scratch this one out first and put, let's see if I've got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like I've uh, taken the minus two root and the plus two root and switched them here. But anyway, CI minus six, CI plus six, and CI minus zero is a projector. I'll have to uh, change that a little bit just to keep notation, but it's going to give us the same uh, idea because switching plus and minus uh, two isn't uh, a bad thing here. Now, um, this is a, a first combination, a projection operator uh, giving us uh, each of those. So we have to work those out. CI squared, and there's CI. Okay, there's CI cubed. Now you put them down uh, so that they're just next to each other so I can uh, separate this thing into a, uh, a reasonable uh, structure. Okay, so I rewrite this thing right here. And then I take two times that one right there. Minus 36 times that one gives me that. 72 times this one gives me that total the whole thing up and I get this uh, uh, thing right here. That's our projection operator right there. So that's that's our first projection operator and that's our first uh, representation. That's our first character row right there. Three, zero, minus one, minus one, minus one. Make sure that the uh, thing jives with having L mu squared here. That's nine over the order of the group which is 24. So I end up with 3 over 8 uh, right there. And then the corresponding numbers uh, right there. Now, the opposite one with a minus 2 is almost the same. It's just that it uh, flips those signs right there. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm going to say, do the rest yourself. This is a good chance for you to see the algebra 
uh, in work. And maybe while you're doing these exercises, you find a really clever way to sort these that's better than the one I've got here. In any case, that's the character table we're looking for. Five characters, five projectors, and uh, the five classes. And that's the thing we're going to work with. And what we need to do is use that character table to do subgroup correlations and level splittings. For the various subgroup chains, that we have, and I'm going to back up uh, this thing uh, uh, to the uh, thing that shows the subgroup chains. There are the subgroup chains uh, that we're uh, going to be uh, drawing from. There's so many there that it's hard to keep track of them all uh, without uh, some aid. So we're going to do um, O symmetry. And as I say, it's really hard to draw a picture of something that only has O symmetry and not O H. So I'll just simply put little whirlpools or bent propeller blades on each of the threefold axes so it has chirality. And what we're saying is that we're um, going to uh, include inversion uh, symmetry. Then we have to get rid of those propellers and get something like this. And that means it has to commute. All of the operators have to commute uh, with inversion. Well, of course they do. It's a unit matrix with a minus sign. And, and there's the symmetry uh, multiplication table for CI. It's just C2. Uh, it's isomorphic to C2. It's the two group. And uh, here is the character table for C2 of 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Now we give it a funny name. Germans. Germans discovered the stuff. Weil, uh, Weierstrass, uh, um, I think uh, Frobenius uh, may have been German as well, but anyway, uh, even and odd is given a German name, Gerade, und Gerade. Straight. Gerade. It's gerade aus, straight ahead. And, um, and Ungra means not straight ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, uh, anyway, um, that's, we're stuck with this notation. Uh, every one of your uh, books is going to have uh, little G's. Uh, on it if they're doing OH. Now we haven't done that yet. In order to get the OH, I simply have to take uh, this little thing here and apply it to this. I have to do an outer product because the I commutes, you see. So I just write the table down again, but with an I in front of every one of these uh, operators that are here. But I commute, so I can go on the other side. I can't do this if it doesn't commute. But it does, and so I can sector it. And then the Ungaradas will be all here. So all of those things, A1, A2, E, T1, and T2, they will all have U's on them for Ungarada, for odd parity, and even parity will have the, the G. And sorry, that's clumsy notation. Now we're going to have much better notation later on when we make this into a permutation group. But uh, this is what everything has right now. So we're kind of stuck with stuff that's written in stone. Then I put the table down again with a minus. So you would uh, think that you could uh, drive so quickly the characters of a group of order 48, but if you can get through the 24, you've got 48 for free, essentially. Now these are actually mirror plane reflections right here. So are these. These are on diagonals, these are on uh, faces. These are weird, I'm sorry. These are on diagonal, these right here, this is 180 degree times an inversion is a mirror plane reflection, simple. This is weird, this is weird. This is a 90 degree rotation reflection, this is a 120 degree rotation inversion, okay? And there's eight of these just like there are eight of these. Those are, that's our class of order eight that we looked at. Uh, a very beginning. That's this class over uh, here, consisting of the R1, R2, and then squared. Little r1, no, little r2, and then r squared. Okay, so that that's the uh, landscape. Everything that we're going to be doing in crystal symmetry with cubic things is going to involve this group. But we're going to back off. We're just going to look at O for the time being.
the table's too big to fit on the screen uh, and use easily. So I'm going back to octahedral now. So we're just going to uh, concentrate on this guy, and this guy is twice as big on this little uh, order scale here uh, as this one, and pretty similar. So what we want to do is we want to uh, take, uh, uh, well, here's a correlation between uh, Grotta and, and uh, OH and OH, very simple lines here, lines here. Uh, when you look at it backwards, those are called parity doublets. We'll get into that later on. Okay, here's what we're after. I want to go from O, after having left OH behind, just forget it for the time being, and go to D4. And then um, I have a choice. I can either go uh, along these lines to C4, and that's what I'm going to pick, or I could go down here to D2. And of course could have come this way to D2. And uh, then it starts getting interesting when you talk about how these different ways of, of breaking the symmetry uh, can interfere with each other. But we won't do that. We're going to just pick one. We're going to first go to D4. Now without um, uh, giving away, this is part of the reason that it would have been maybe better uh, to uh, demand that uh, you finish the homework that has D4 in it, but there's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're cheating now. <laughs> so, uh, it's pretty simple. It's got uh, basically the character table of the D2 group and then one doubler. So, it, it's really uh, very beautiful in some ways. And that's uh, what we're going to use. We're going to uh, reduce this symmetry uh, down to uh, this one, octahedral down to D4. Okay? So, that's what we mean by. Uh, this pathway here is that I'm looking at the possibility that I'm going to crush uh, or do something to this, oh, I'm, I'm actually going to twist a little bit the top uh, one relative to the other without doing it to the uh, x, y, just doing it to z axis or y axis and not doing it x and z. I guess something that looks like that, a four-bladed propeller. Okay? In that symmetry, these levels will be relabeled and split. That's what uh, the physics uh, is. And then finally, I'm going to go from D4 to C4. So here are th three correlation problems. I should say three groups whose correlations is two pairs. And that's what I want to uh, spend the time on. Uh, let's do this one first. So how do you do the correlation? How do you do a subduction of O to D4? Well, D4 consists of a z axis 180 degrees, a z axis plus and minus 90, that's two elements, so there's four elements all together, and then a rho z uh, 180 degrees, and a i3 and an i4 uh, element uh, that uh, needs to be accounted for uh, here. Um, Actually, uh, let's see if I've got that right. Here's a Z 180, and that's a typo. This should be X and Y 180. There's got to mm. be four elements of this type, this type right here, and then um, uh, <clears throat> a row Z 180, and then two elements right here. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements all together in this group. So um, I'll go and fix that little typo. Uh, it's right here. It should be X and Y. Okay, so here it's correctly drawn. And what you have to do is say, okay, uh, I don't have any 120 degrees in this group at all, so just cross out and forget that column of the octahedral group. That symmetry is gone. As soon as I twisted that thing, I ruined that. But I didn't ruin the other uh, guys here, at least not all of them. So the next class that I look at, besides the unit class, right, there's the unit class right there, we're going to be matching that up with this, uh, but we have to do it uh, row by row. Okay, so we look at the A1 here, and that would be a matching this guy with that guy. Then this guy right here has to match with this guy here. Uh, the, the, those, this one is a 
180 degree rotation, this is a 90 degree rotation, so it comes out of that one. Then this, this guy here is around the edges, so I, do, I use these things straight away. I just use this last uh, column uh, straight away. Now, if I go ahead and I write down the numbers that I see in the, according to that assignment, well, they're all ones, so I know right away that the thing I call A1 uh, in the octahedral group is going to be also called A1 in the D4. So I write that down. That was easy. But the next one and the next one, you got to be careful because this little switcheroo right here, okay? This one right here matches up with A2 because of the switcheroo, right? So you have to be careful with that. Okay? So that's the relabeling. This thing's going to be called B1. Let's see if I've got that uh, right here. Now I have to be real careful here. Let's see if that's where it's going to row B, row 180. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that is okay. This is a Z 180, this is an X and Y 180. They're all the same class here, but they're in a different class uh, right here. And then this is mine. So that's a B1 for D4. E though, the E is uh, rather interesting. Okay, this, this guy uh, right here. Okay, I go two, two, zero, and then I have to use it again, this row Z uh, guy, I have to use the two over again because they're in different classes. It should have been X and Y, as I, I said. And uh, that gives me the uh, numbers here. And then I have to figure out how does this uh, combine uh, uh, to make uh, something out of here. Okay, I see a two and a two, so it could have been any one of these paired. And then I uh, look at that. Got to get rid of the cell phone. <laughs> Damn thing, sometimes they're a pain in the butt. Um, this, this right here, uh, somehow I've got to add up to get a zero on the Z plus or minus nine. Now I could add those two or I could add those two. And the question is which, okay? Well, if I add, um, let's say, Let's see if I've got that. If I add that up, um, 90 count. Yeah, that count. That one, let's see if, I'm going to peek here and see what the answer is. If I go with A1 and B1, I get a zero and a zero right there. So it's the top two that uh, come out there. So there's a splitting of the E that uh, is uh, showing up there. And then T1, that, that's a, uh, a weird one, okay? I've got to match this thing with something here. Well, it's probably going to involve this, so maybe it might be this one right here. One plus two is three. Uh, minus two plus one, that's minus one. There's a minus, so that doesn't work, okay? Uh, so I go up and try again, you see. Now, of course, I could stop immediately and use the orthogonality projection that we had before for calculating, remember? Uh, we uh, use that to uh, do the splitting of the atomic orbitals, right? Uh, we first did the sort of sloppy thing we're doing right now, uh, and it worked for the first two or three, but then we're already sort of in deep doo-doo. You might be saying, I'm just going to get the formula out and figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, you have to uh, decide, is that more work than just sitting here and trying, uh, you know, the, the combinations? Because there is only one combination that's worked. That is. Uh, one thing that you're guaranteed here. And um, in this particular case, uh, E plus A2 uh, is supposed to work. I get two here, I get a minus, a three here, I get a minus one there, uh, that's good. Um, here I get, um, let's see if I, uh, if that's uh, right here, I, I uh, let that, that, that. Adding that one, I get a one, okay, there, that's good. And then here, uh, adding these two, uh, minus one and minus one, bingo. That, so if I just waited and got, got, that would be okay. Try this one and this one, and it won't work, but this one will, 
these three don't work. So that's the trial and error method for correlation. Obviously, a formula uh, is going to be necessary for things more complicated than, than that. Here I am on pressure on the television screen, and so it's a hard time for me uh, to get it. But, uh, you know, when I'm sitting at my desk, I would breeze through this easily. Uh, again, uh, T2, this thing, okay? Minus 1, twice, minus 1, and 1. Okay, I've got to add that up uh, with this. And uh, if you check E plus B2, uh, right here, here's B2. And uh, that looks good. 1, minus 1, minus 1 minus 1 and 3. Okay, so it checks. That's our D4 correlation right there. All right. Before we lose this precious uh, calculation, we make a correlation table. A1 goes to A1. A2 goes to B1. E goes to A1 plus B1. Okay, and just follow the colored lines there. Uh, to see what I'm trying to show you. Uh, here T1 goes to uh, E and an A2. And here E and a B2. All right? Okay, so this, this is the, as I say, the heart of the sort of usual calculations you do uh, with these uh, groups. Now we've got to go C4, okay? Now th this way I'm going to do this a, a sort of silly way and then I'll, I'm going to make some sense out of it. Uh, the first thing of course that I do is uh, see what it is that C4 has. C4 has uh, the rotations by 90 degrees, first around the Z axis um, and then uh, let's see if uh, the, that squared around the Z axis 180 and that cubed around the z-axis, or inverted from this one, is minus 90. So I simply am going to try to find out which of these, 0 mod 4, 1 mod 4, 2 mod 4, and 3 mod 4, uh, are going to match up with, and then I have to uh, go ahead and write uh, the, um, the A1, D4, 2, C4, okay, and I have to use the right uh, element. Z uh, with 90 degrees, uh, Z with 180, and then Z with um, 90 degrees again. And these two will be the same because they're in the same class uh, up there. Okay? So there's A1, C4. Well, big surprise. It's the scalar, what would other people would call A1 for this one. I don't. I, I use that symbolism. Uh, right there, so I'm going to put it here, 0, 4, very clearly. And then B1 for C4, okay? Uh, I look at the uh, table up here, uh, B1 right there, okay? I just write out each of the uh, elements that occur uh, in the D4 group that I'm uh, looking at right now. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, okay? There's the Z uh, 90 degrees. And then there's the 180 degrees uh, right there, and then there's the minus one for this one again. Okay, so that's what B1 is going to do. And I've crossed out the elements that aren't in C4 there. And then uh, the next step, uh, that's of course uh, when you look at the table down here, that's uh, 2 mod 4. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 is 2 mod 4. Then I'm going to take A2 apart up here, this guy right here. It's all ones, so it's just going to give me 0, 4 again. And then this B2 here, that's uh, this guy, okay? So I got a minus 1 again for the 90, okay? Then I got 1 here for 180, and I got another minus 1. It's just like this one. It's going to be 2 by 4 again. Okay, so that's what you get. 0 and 2, angular momentum around the C4 axis uh, popping out. Now the tricky part, uh, E, and it's not terribly tricky, but uh, just take these numbers right here, 2 and minus 2, 100 million for that, and 0 uh, for the uh, 90 degrees, plus or minus, okay? And see how you can make that 
uh, with this thing. Well, pretty obviously, I got to get rid of these imaginaries. So I see right away that one adding up one plus three four. Okay, let's stop here because the next thing I do is bewildering. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe we should just rush into it before the battery runs uh, runs out. Uh, we, Here's where um, I kind of go crazy. I say, I want to go uh, directly. Uh, first of all, there's the correlation table. That's not so crazy, okay? I just come down here and say, A1 comes and gives me a 0, 4. Uh, then 2, 4 is popping out here for B1, okay? This is the B1 right here, okay? So it's coming out there with a 2, 4. Then it's back to a, a zero 4 for A2, that's this guy, and then B2, another 2, 4. And then E gives me plus and minus 1 mod 4. Okay, so far so good? That's easy. Now what I want to do is a correlation table of O directly to C4. Well, here's sort of a dumb way to do it. You say, okay, it's got to go through D4. So I, I look at the D4 here, and uh, I uh, notice that it's A1. So uh, A1 is associated with 0, 4, so that's not so hard. I know that that's going to uh, come out to be A1, uh, which is breaking down to a 0, 4. And then the next one is A2. I see that right away if I you know, go through this A2 right here. Okay, that's 2 mod 4. And then this one's back to 1, but this one has an E. The e is, is coming out with both 0, 4 and 2, 4. Okay, because of that. Okay, I'm basically co 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 collapsing uh, 0, 4 and 2, 4. This one, uh, same thing. Uh, it collapses. Uh, to a 1, 1, 1, under 1, 4, minus 1, uh, 4, and uh, 0, 4. And then the same thing with this one, that uh, collapses uh, to this. Now this is a better way to do it. You do, first of all, a diagram of the actual splittings as, they, as a physicist would do it, instead of a mathematician. Uh, show what A1, A2, E, and T1, T2 do, okay? Uh, that's the uh, O uh, splitting to D4 right here. This one is going to become A1. A2 is being relabeled B1 by the D4 people. The E is A1 plus B1. Okay, that's this one right here. And then this one is A2 plus E. A2 plus E. And this one is B2 plus E. B2 plus E. Okay. And then you just say, all right, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to just uh, use the correlation table that I already have for uh, the C4 here and just write them out by changing the names, relabeling here, and then doing the splitting that the uh, uh, D4 to C4 uh, did for me. So I already got an E here. It's just going to split in 1, 4, and 2, uh, minus 1, 4. You see, so this is a much more, you know, much easier on your head and pattern recognition to draw the levels as they come. Or this is the splitting of the spectral, splitting of the central idempotence into the irreducible idempotence. If I were to use this subgroup chain, and we'll talk more about that later on. Anyway, this is a really uh, important correlation table right here. Oh, directly to C4. And that brings us to a preview, just the last two slides here, uh, a preview of what we're going to do with this. This is a summary of what we've uh, essentially had already with a couple of extra things. Remember those numbers, order of the group, okay? Order of the class, centrum. Okay, the order of the center is 5. You just sum up uh, all of these numbers uh, right here. Okay, to the zeroth power, uh, that comes to 5. To the first power, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 6.
okay? This one plus one plus two plus three plus three, that's ten. That's the rank of this group. And then the order is the sum of the squares. This is something we could have checked when we were making the character table uh, earlier. So one squared plus one squared plus four plus nine plus nine is the order of the group 24 for octahedral symmetry. Given these dimensions, you see, the first column. And then the correlation table that we worked out, just going to C4, is right here. Now, for an exercise, I'm going to have to go to C3. And there's the answer, but don't look. Try to do this, you know, yourself, okay? That's a, 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 a nice exercise involving e to the 2 pi i over 3. Now, um, what I want to show you is how we use this. We use it by reading it backwards in a very peculiar situation involving huge angular momentum and uh, molecules that are pretty heavy and really spinning. Um, if I uh, look at a cluster associated with 0 mod 4, I see an A1, an E, and a T1. Look at one with a plus 1 or a minus 1, I get T1 plus T2. Then with an angular momentum 2 mod 4, I get a 1 here at A2 and an E and a T2. T2. Okay? That's what you see in this incredible spectrum that's on the wall back there uh, involving uh, the SF6 molecule, that's this thing right here. Uh, vibrational spectrum in the uh, 16 micron infrared region, that's around 600 uh, waves per centimeter. Um, we have an incredible landscape, which is amazing. Anybody could even see it with this much resolution. When you blow up each one of these peaks, you get a pattern like this. In this particular case, it's the peak associated with a total angular momentum of 88. And what's showing up on one side of the spectrum are exactly the clusters that I was talking about. A1, E, and T1 uh, show up wherever it's divisible by 4. 88, the highest possible angular momentum, is divisible by 4. It has an A1, T1, E. And that's what you see right there. And then the next one, in, this is all inside this. This is a cluster. They are so tight. This, this thing has a splitting equal to a, 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 a tunneling time of 50,000 years. This is really tight. So uh, I should say that I see A1 and T1 and E and I, I do not in the experiment. I don't see that until I get down in this region right around in here. I can actually split out uh, something in the kilohertz or uh, megahertz uh, region. There's an A1, T1, E that you can see at the uh, resolution of this particular uh, diagram. But uh, the, the people have been able to do this to kilohertz resolution. So we are seeing what's going on in every one of these uh, levels to that precision. And there sits a cluster. You see A1, T1, E. And then next door to it, a T1, T2, which is this. Then next door to that, an A2, T2, T2 a, I should say E, T2, A2, and then T2, T1 again uh, at the end. And then it starts over again. Boom, boom, boom. Start over again. Boom, boom. And then it goes crazy. Because then the molecule gets stuck on the, instead of rotating like this, it gets stuck rotating like threefold around its triangular faces. And then that homework problem uh, that I assigned to you uh, becomes effective. And this is a picture of the levels under some weird conditions that we'll describe later. And this is a uh, face surface that we use to um, characterize the uh, high angular momentum states. So we've got some work to do to understand all of this stuff. But uh, already at this point you can see that uh, this is a calculation uh, that uh, absolutely mystified people. We were lucky to uh, come upon it at a time when people were sort of uh, lurching about in, this, in the darkness of symmetry analysis and realize that induced representations were really important for actual spectra, not just as a calculational tool. So I will end with that just as a uh, um, sort of a uh, 
a preview of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the, 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 the much of the rest of the of this in these lectures. But um, the uh, thing that uh, we need to answer, of course, is what about the ordering and how are they spaced? That has to do with these little tunneling. We've already done problems like that with clusters. So uh, those are the physical consequences, some of the physical consequences of the symmetry. So this is a case where no one could explain what was going on with the existing form of symmetry analysis. But with doubling it to inside and out, this makes sense. And I hope it will to you uh, after a while. <laughs> okay, we'll stop for here.